Well, good morning. You guys doing okay? Yeah, good to see you. I have my Bible open to Matthew chapter 7. Um, so you guys know that we have been kind of flip-flopping back and forth with the Sermon on the Mount and the Gospel of Mark and the Sermon on the Mount and the Gospel of Mark. And not only are we wearing towards the end of uh, Mark, but also Matthew as well. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. So I have my Bible open there. You're more than welcome to turn over there with me, if you will. Um, and I want to start off with a question. So what, what would you say is the world's favorite, most favoritist Bible verse? Huh? John 3.16. And what's John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? I knew you were going to say that, man. I had a, I had a feeling. A lot of people said John 3.16, right? Eh, wrong. You know what it is? It's Matthew 7, 1. Judge not lest you be judged. That's the world's favorite verse. I'm going to tell you how I, I learned this, okay? So way back when, uh, before I started preaching, I was a student uh, at an art school over at IUPUI. And um, it was, I don't remember exactly when it was, but one day I was walking from the library there on IUPUI going across the field to get to the student center. Some of you guys who are students there, you know where I'm talking about. And in the middle of that walk is this big area, right? Where people are playing games, they're hanging out, they're doing stuff. And there was this open air preacher, which is just another way of saying uh, a street preacher, right? And he's standing there and he's talking. He's one of those, the end is nigh, repent or perish types. Um, he, he's, he's talking to this group. And I think, you know, if you're going to go out there and preach the gospel and you're going to be around a lot of liberal arts students who might not disagree with your message, I mean, you got to have nerves of steel to be able to do something like that, right? Especially when people are trying to go back and forth with you and talk. And so I decided to go by and hear this guy. And this was, I, I learned later, this was a guy who frequently does this at the IUPUI campus. Maybe you guys have seen him or know who I'm talking about. But I decided to go by and listen to him, and um, <laughs> so, he, so he's there, it's a, it's a hot sunny day, he's speaking, and there's this big crowd that's kind of wrapped around him, and he starts getting these hecklers, right? And, and all of a sudden, uh, one of the students, I guess, in order to disrupt this guy, he kind of knows this guy's whole schedule, he knows when he's gonna speak, and he kind of got quick to it and decided that he would start bringing a boom box to rickroll the guy. Now, do you guys know what rickrolling is? No? Okay. All right. So, <laughs> okay. So, Rick Rolling is where, um, let, let's say you're on the internet. It's basically like an internet joke, an internet meme, an internet prank. And what happens is, let's say you're looking at an article and you're reading this article and you're trying to go along, you read page one, you read page two, and all of a sudden, surprise, on your screen pops up a YouTube video of Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. Okay, do you guys know this song? Rick Astley's never going to give you up, right? You know the rule. I'm, I'm, I'm a great dancer, I promise you. Um, do you guys get it now? Do I have to keep doing this? All right. So, uh, so this song is playing, right? And you're, you're sitting in the crowd. He's preaching. And all of a sudden, you see this boom box begin to levitate in the group. And as soon as he's talking, never going to never going to, and click, and he stops talking. And he starts speaking again. Never gonna let you down. Never gonna. And this poor guy, I mean, they did it like two or three times, and he's having to walk around <laughs> to another place. And um, I listen. I, I love the '80s as much as anyone else. But if I catch anybody with a boombox in here, <laughs> Susan, <laughs> I'm going to tackle you in the name of Jesus. Um. But I said that to say this, so it, it, was pretty, it was pretty funny. It was kind of cruel, but it was kind of funny. Um, one of the things that would happen, though, is that this, this crowd would be around this guy, just wrapped around this guy. And I noticed, to my utter astonishment, that they would keep quoting a Bible passage to him. 
in order to quiet him, in order to shut him up. And the Bible passage was, judge not lest you be judged. Judge not lest you be judged. Judge not lest you be judged. Now at this point in my walk with Christ, in which I didn't have a walk with Christ, I knew that this was probably a part of the Bible. I mean, I had heard it. It sounds like that Elizabethan King James language, right? So I knew it was in the Bible. But I thought it was so weird. This guy over here, he's preaching the Bible, and all around the people are misquoting the Bible, misquoting the scripture to him, as if the world's best interpreters of the Bible would be those who hate it, right? And they're quoting this passage to get him to be quiet. And what they meant was, mind your own business. Stop talking. Don't preach to us anymore. Go take your God stuff elsewhere. That's the text we're going to be dealing with today. But I want to encourage you to read it in the context of what's happening here in this story. Consider what's happening in Matthew chapter 7. So go ahead and grab your Bibles with me. And uh, if you're a newer student of the Bible, no worries. This is the first gospel in your New Testament. It's going to be page 812 in your pew Bible. And you're encouraged to grab your Bible. If you've been here a member for a while, greet your neighbor next to you and give them a Bible so they can turn here with us. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 1. Judge not, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank sticking in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And that is God's word. So as you remember, and as even Rick had opened up his singing uh, at the the beginning of the service, this is all about kingdom people, okay? Jesus is sitting down with his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, surrounded by his disciples, thousands of them perhaps, and he preaches a sermon spanning Matthew 5 to 7, and he's teaching them the kingdom ethic, the kingdom way. He's trying to show them what disciples of the kingdom look and live like, right? That's what's happening here. And he's particularly teaching them against the religious hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He says so in chapter 5 and verse 20, that we need to extend our righteousness even above the Pharisees and the scribes, otherwise you will by no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, really quickly, I just have a few points to make. What is Jesus not saying? What is he saying? And what's verse 6 all about, okay? So let's go ahead and start with the first one. What Jesus is not saying, okay? He is not saying, don't judge. For all of us who would misquote scripture, all the Rick Rollers out there, he's not saying don't judge. Now, I know that it might seem like I have to make some huge interpretational leaps to make that point because it does seem pretty clearly that Jesus is saying don't judge. But I want you to think about all the different ways that we can use the word judge, right? Like the judge doesn't just mean condemn harshly. It can mean to to distinguish between two different things. You judge, right? Jesus isn't saying that uh, we shouldn't have a litigious society. He's not saying that we shouldn't have a law court in which there are judges, Judge Judy and all the rest that (laughs) sit over these issues. He's saying that we should actually recognize and distinguish between certain truths. Uh, And we know this because if you just look later on in the text, chapter 7, verse 15, what does he tell them to do? Well, if you're looking at your own Bible, he's telling them to watch out for false prophets. Well, how do you know the difference between a false prophet, one who's saying things that are false, and a true prophet, one who is delivering the true word of God? you got to distinguish. You have to judge, right? Not only that, in Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus himself says, I and the 12 disciples with me will be sitting on 12 thrones to judge the tribes of Israel. Jesus himself is going to come again one day as the appointed judge over mankind. And not only that, but I, I love this passage. So there's a story in John 7, right? And in John 7, what Jesus has done is, like, like he normally does, he's going around healing people. And he happens to heal this guy on the Sabbath day. He makes his whole body well. And, and you know, these, these, these religious hypocrites, these Pharisees, these religious elite type people, they're just flipping out on Jesus, right? You can't heal on the Sabbath. And, and he says, I, I want you to analyze this situation fully, okay? He says, go back to your law. If you circumcise 
on the eighth day, sometimes that eighth day is going to fall on a Sabbath day. In order to obey the law, you do this religious work of circumcising a person so he can be inside the covenant people of Israel on the Sabbath day. And then you judge me because I make a whole man's body well on the Sabbath day? He says there, quote, in verse 24 of chapter 7, do not judge by appearance, by outward estimations only, but judge with righteous judgment. Look really to the heart of the issue and make a better discernment of what's going on here. So Jesus doesn't mean, he's not saying don't judge. That's, that's something that's apparent, a common sense really. It's something that we have to do, honestly. Judging the scene right now, uh, so to speak, the spear of the age is, is one that is intensely allergic to making any kind of truth claim. I don't know if you guys have been on any social network recently, but uh, you know, you have the way that people talk today. We're allergic to making any absolute truth claim over basically any of the decisions in life that actually matter. Like if, you can be as opinionated as possible about things that ultimately don't matter, but when it comes to the bigger picture things, you can't have an opinion on that. You certainly can't be preachy about it, right? Because I have my truth and you have your truth. And so, you know, that kind of thing. But there's a difference between making an allowance for somebody, for someone, and, and then thinking that that allowance is actually legitimate. It goes against the grain of what Paul is telling us is happening in us in Romans 12, where he says that we're having our, 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 our senses trained to discern right and wrong. We need to grow in that area. In a culture especially that no longer is able to draw a straight line, we, we, we're not even drawing squiggly lines. We're, draw, we're, we're not even drawing perforated lines. We're just not drawing lines at all. We do need to have the ability to discern. Absolutely. Now, that's what he's not saying. Now, the next one's a doozy. Here's what he is saying. He is saying, don't judge. He is saying, don't judge, okay? Now, I want you to think about the contradiction because it's on purpose. It's a paradox. Like the last point, he is saying, don't judge, depending on what you mean by judging, okay? Now, Jesus tells us very clearly in the text that there are two types of judgment he's outlawing that he doesn't want us to engage in. Here's the first one. He says in verse 5 of chapter 7, if you are a hypocrite... If you're hypocritical, do not judge. And what he means by that is if you are a stage actor, if you are wanting other people as a religious person to live up to the standard that you, in fact, do not live up to, don't judge. He says that's being a hypocrite. If you've not looked first at your own issues, he, I mean, he does it humorously. Jesus was a joke teller, man. He says, look, if you're trying to get that speck of sawdust in someone's eye, and all the while this is what you look like, like, who wants to go underneath the knife of a blind eye surgeon? That's what he's talking about here, right? Like, get that away from me. That's the idea. If you have a critical, don't judge. Here's the second way. He says there in verse 2, If you've not considered God's own judgment, if you've not considered the standard of which God is going to judge you, yourself, on the last day when you stand at that bar on high, don't judge. To judge others with this harsh, condemning, severely critical word is like dancing on a power line. One day it's going to come back to bite you because Jesus, God himself, will use your standard that you exacted on everybody else and he will use it on you. So if you've not thought about that, be very careful when you judge. Listen, this is, there's a reason why this is so crucial. Jesus, in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, he's not just, just throwing things in there because he'll make a good sermon. This is all related to the bigger picture. And what he's trying to do is to create a people who will live by a different standard than what we see in the Pharisees. The Pharisees, he says, yeah, they were the most religious people at the time, but they were hypocrites. It grieved him to his heart what he saw in chapter 5 and verse 20. He has a severely critical word for them, right? He saw people obsessed with keeping up appearances, with using the law and their interpretations of the law, their traditions to abuse the people. Let me ask you a very real question. Do you know anybody or have we ever used our religious speculations or traditions to harshly and severely criticize others? You betcha. Yeah, you betcha. Yes, we have. Jesus says, if you can just see your own sins, if you can just cast your gaze upon yourself, 
you're going to be more realistic about the struggles of others because then you can empathize. And with this empathy for another person comes a person who, who will be more helpful to others. Listen, if you can empathize really with the burden that is on your brother or sister in Christ, if you can empathize with a particular struggle, a drug addiction, uh, some, some theft or, or forgery or so, some issue that someone's dealing with, then you're going to be able to empathize easier with this person. Right? You're going to be more helpful if you see them underneath this sin. In other words, one who has experienced the pain of a thorn in their eye is going to be super gentle and probably not use a pair of tweezers about getting those getting those thorns out of the other person's eye, right? In other words, I like the way that he wraps it up in chapter 7, verse 12. Look in your Bible there, chapter 7, verse 12. You ever wonder where this is coming from? It seems like Jesus is speaking just out of left field. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. What we have since called the golden rule. That's what he's telling them to live by, right? Jesus is taking the fact that we will judge and make distinctions. He's resituating that judgment in the context of our relationship with, with, number one, with us, how we want people to treat us. But secondly, he's resituating that in the context of what God is doing. He says, how do you want to be treated, number one? But then secondly, how do you want to be treated by your father? Verse two, if you resituate your judgment in that, and you ask those questions, you're going to come off as a different kind of person. And that's what he's saying. I was listening to a friend's podcast, and it it was super helpful. She said something amazing. She said, our social network today is filled with cynics and critics. You know what I'm talking about. World filled with cynics and critics. We're stuffed with information. We're overflowing with opinions on everything, even if we're not exactly the most qualified person to give our opinion, buddy, we're going to let you know that we have something to say about this, okay? If you give me that that free news feed underneath your comments because you posted something on Facebook, I'm going to fill it up with my opinion because you're entitled to it and and God bless you, okay? That's what we're going to do. We're going to tell people this. And we need to hear what Jesus said. Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. Now, that doesn't mean, like I've seen, that we get grouchy at judgmental people, maybe particularly people we've seen in the church, because it's always easy to pick on them, right? And then we're content with everyone just minding your own business. Okay, you mind your own business, I'll mind my own business, we mind our own business. That would be to fall short of what Jesus is actually calling us to do. Because he goes on to say, look, if you remove that log then you will be able to help your brother and see clearly what's happening with them. That would be to leave the law, but Jesus wants us to remove the law. Instead, Jesus says kingdom people are those who are harshest with their own sins, not with others, realizing that the sins killing the most at any particular given point of the time is their own. And this makes them most helpful in really being people who can walk with others through their pain and the trials and their sins. Man, the world be a better place if people were like that. Amen? That's what Jesus is shooting for with this Sermon on the Mount, is to create disciples like that. Now, now we've talked about that. Uh, that's the simple part. We're going to get to a kind of interesting verse here in verse 6, okay? And you know I like to do that in sermons. If it's, if it's a verse that kind of like troubles me, we're going to spend a little bit more time on that, okay? So, so this is <laughs> this is crazy, okay? So verse 6, all right? Let's look at this text again. He ends this whole discussion about judgment, judge or not judge, all that kind of stuff. He says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls before pigs. If you do, they may trample them under feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, is Jesus speaking to farmers at this time? Is he trying to give some help to Farmer John about what to do with his wife's string of pearls? No, that's not what's happening here. He's speaking in metaphor, okay? And here's what he's saying. First of all, what does this have to do with anything? My, my, uh, my thinking has changed a lot over the years on this passage. I want to tell you what I used to do. I want to tell you what I do now, okay? So what I would used to do, like the beginning of the sermon, any time that I heard Rick Rollers, right, uh, misquoting this passage, Matthew 7, 1, judge not, lest you be judged, to the preacher, I would do one of these numbers. Oh, man, don't you know that you are misquoting scripture, my friend? right? (laughs) As I was judging them. And don't you realize you're misquoting the scripture? That's what I would say in my head. 
And then that's when I read Matthew 7 and verse 6, because it balances the whole discussion. See, here's what Jesus is doing. He's using temple language, right? Notice he's talking about clean, unclean, sacred, uh, desecrated, holy, unholy. He's using temple imagery, particularly imagery that we find in Exodus 29, where Moses would sprinkle the blood of the covenant upon various instruments in the temple, and now they've been sprinkled with this purified blood, signifying life. They were made holy, and anything that touched that holy thing would be holy, uh, unless it was unclean, which of course it would make it unclean. You know, we, we don't have that kind of language as much today, and, and that's kind of sad, but, but that's the temple language that he's using. And what he is saying is, if you give a pig a big bowl of slop, you would never drop a pearl on top, right? Because that pig is going to go there and he's going to say, oh, what a mighty fine pearl and put that to the side and eat the slop. No, he's not going to do that. He's not going to care at all. He's not going to be able to distinguish between what is holy, what is good, what is beautiful, and the slop. Likewise, he says, you don't take holy teachings of Jesus and indiscriminately toss them to people who do not want it. Let me say that again. You do not take the holy and sacred teachings of Jesus and indiscriminately toss it to people who do not want it, do not care for it, are disinterested, are rickrolling, i.e., that kind of idea. Now, this doesn't mean all believers. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that we should just, you know, hoard the gospel goodness to ourselves. No. But for the antagonistic ones, for the ones Jesus says will turn back and tear you to pieces, some, Jesus says, look, I'm going to be real with you. Some just don't have ears to hear. They just don't. Some, they, they, might, even, they might even get so close as they come into the church building for years, still don't have ears to hear. They don't care. They're not worried about it. I was reading Confucius. I feel like I should say, Confucius say. But Confucius did say this. Um, he says, I will not open the door for a mind that is not already striving to understand. Nor will I provide words for a tongue that is not already struggling to speak. If I hold up one corner of a problem and the student cannot come back to me with the other three, I will not attempt to instruct him again. Jesus had the very same attitude with his discipleship. Look, my time and the gospel are so precious, are so holy, that if you do not care about what I'm giving you, I will not open your gaping maw and force feed you with the gospel. Instead, I will tell you to shake the dust off your garments and proceed to the next town. That's what he's saying. And so here's what I think now versus what I used to think, right? Now, if I hear Rick Rollers... Now, if I hear protesters, I don't shake my head at them for taking the passage out of context. Now, I actually agree with them. I actually think, you know what, preacher, you probably, if they're going to keep following you with the Rick Rolling, even though it's a great song and all that kind of stuff, I think maybe you should just wipe the dust off your clothes and continue on. But here's the only change I would make. I would actually think that maybe they should, in fact, instead of saying, judge not lest you be judged, maybe they actually should be saying, do not give the dogs what is holy. That's probably what they should be saying. Because that fits better. Here's the good news of this passage. Here's the summons. That's not everyone here. Now I know that, you know, verse 6 is kind of depressing. That that's, that's the way the world is. But that's not everyone. The world is filled with more than Rick Rollers. Praise God, okay? That's why Jesus goes on to speak about real seekers who do desire holy things. Did you notice that? Jesus isn't coming out of left field with some random to-do in verses 7 through 11 of Matthew chapter 7. Look what he says. He goes on to talk about real seekers, for he says this in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Amen, amen. 
that there are real seekers out here and there is a real God, that if you seek what is good, God will give it. He promises that. He will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. If you think you're a good gift giver, Jesus says, look, you ain't got nothing on God. He promises you that he loves you even more than we could possibly ever love our children. And he will give us good gifts if we're willing to seek after them, if we want them genuinely, and if we have ears to hear. And this same God has proven it by giving his son to win salvation, by giving his Holy Spirit to apply that salvation. He did not come in judgment at the first, but he came to save. That's the Christ who came. Amen. If you're not a Christian this morning and you want to be made right with God, you want to have forgiveness of sin, to be baptized in the water for the remission of your sins, if, if you want to be free from the judgment of God, having it placed upon Jesus that you might be free and liberated, standing as a glorified son or daughter of God now, you can have that by professing that you believe Jesus is Lord and being buried in the waters of baptism with him. If you have any need, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing this song for your encouragement.